So we're talking about family faith in this current sermon series, and I had a phone conversation this past week with a very dear friend who is a pastor, and he gave me a, a story about his own family that I realized as soon as I heard it, I had to share with you all. And so I was kind of furiously scribbling it down as he was telling it so I could make sure to get it right. He's a pastor at a church down in Texas, and they are not currently focusing on what we're focusing on in their sermons, their current sermon series, but he said that he is focusing on it in his own family, that this is a season where he and his wife are trying to be more intentional about the way that they are practicing faith with their three children. So they have two girls and a boy. The oldest is uh, a daughter who is in junior high school, and they kind of work their way down from there. Their youngest is the other daughter who is in elementary school. And he said that the other night that they were praying together in their living room, they've started carving out time in the evening where they put all their devices down, they shut their phones off, turn off the television, and they gather together around the coffee table in the living room, and they pray together, and they read the Bible together. And he said that He and his wife have been really encouraging their children to pray so that it's not just the two of them praying for the family and the children, but that the children would also take turns praying. And he said it took them a little while to come out of their shell, but they're actually starting to do it. And this past weekend was a, a, last weekend was a breakthrough because his oldest daughter had been learning about the fruits of the Spirit from chapter 5 of the letter to the Galatians in Sunday school. And during prayer time, they paused and gave the children the opportunity to pray. And this oldest daughter started praying for the youngest daughter. And, and, And my friend said that he snuck a peek, you know. He had his eyes closed, but that he kind of, he kind of opened up an eye to see. And lo and behold, his oldest girl was laying hands on the youngest girl. Was actually laying hands on her and praying for her. And he said that she was earnestly and fervently praying that the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon her little sister and that she would come to know all of the fruits of the Spirit in her own life. And he said that in a moment, he just lost it. He said just waterworks. He was just a mess, you know, was trying to stay silent. But that it was just an amazing thing to see this adolescent girl praying for her elementary school aged little sister, that, and that he, it was exactly what he had hoped would happen. He said he found himself kind of thinking, it, it's working, it's working, you know. Um, and then he said something, and this is what caused me to grab pen and paper and to start writing it down, because I wanted to remember exactly what he said, and this is what he shared with me. He said, the thing that I want most in my life and ministry is for people to understand that all of this is real. Isn't that a wonderful way to put it? That when the church, when we talk about in the church the reality of life in the Holy Spirit, it's not like Hollywood advertising for the latest summer blockbuster. You know, come and have this kind of amazing experience and then go back to your normal life. Okay? That actually the quotidian, the ho-hum, humdrum of daily life is not what's real. That what's real is is the power of the Holy Spirit. And that when you have these experiences like my friend had with his two daughters when they were praying together around the coffee table, what you're experiencing is the way that God wants it all to be. He went on and he said, the gospel is the way that things are meant to be. The gospel is what's real. That what they were seeing that night in their living room was a glimpse of where God is carrying us. And the more that we're open to it, and the more that we embrace it, the more that we will be able to see with real eyes of faith all the time. The more that we will be able to experience the power of the Holy Spirit, the reality of spiritual gifts, the reality of spiritual fruits being born in our own lives. I had that conversation with my friend, and I thought, there is no better way that I could sum up what I'm wanting this sermon series on practicing family faith and, on fo- and focusing on family ministry. There's no better way that I could sum up what I want all of that to be about. This is 
what God is calling us towards, and we can experience it more fully in groups of people and in our own families than we can experience it by ourselves. Go back to the way that we started this last week in talking about Moses and about how Moses had, under God's guidance, led the people through those long years in the wilderness until they had gotten to the banks of the Jordan River. And he sat there, and what he gave them is what we find in the book of Deuteronomy. And that is the reteaching of the law. Moses realized, you, you, you see, that he wasn't going in with them. He was going to have to bid them farewell. And so he wanted to impress upon them what God had handed down to them at Sinai. He wanted to expound upon that so that they would understand how they were to live with God and with one another once they entered into the land. And if you'll remember what I shared with you last week from Deuteronomy 6 was Moses teaching that the number one thing that we are to do is to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts and with all of our strength. And then in the very next statement, what Moses said to them is, now, you got to diligently teach this to your children. You've got to teach it to your kids. It's so important. And what Moses was getting at by that is he knew what they were going to face. And, And in fact, it is what they faced because the entire history of the Jews thereafter was of constantly being tempted by the nations that lived around them that had much more permissive life ways that were able to eat things and to worship and to act in a way that the Hebrews were charged by God not to do. And so Moses knew that it was going to be up to parents and grandparents to teach God's law to the children so that they would know how they were to live. So the question today is, I want to return to that, and the question today is then, how was that teaching supposed to actually happen? I had a teacher myself in seminary who uh, once, I can't even remember the context that this was taught in, but it really stuck with me. And, And what it was that he said to us in class one day was, he said, if you want to truly know someone, You have to learn their story. Think about that for a second. Think about that. If you want to truly know someone, you have to learn their story. Now, there's there's all sorts of different ways to learn about somebody, right? I mean, our lives, you could break them down into statistics if you wanted to. I mean, you could memorize somebody's birthday. You could learn their social security number. You could memorize their entire tax return and learn an awful lot about their family finances, right? You could move into more personal stuff. You could find out what their favorite color is. You could learn the names of their children. You could find out what their favorite baseball team is. You could put all of this in a spreadsheet. Would you know the person? I would suggest to you that you would not. That we, what might, you might be able to describe us in statistics, but just learning those facts, just learning bullet points about somebody is not really coming to know who the person is. That in point of fact, if you want to really learn who someone is, you have to have the patience and the willingness to sit down and listen to their story. You got to learn where they came from, where they grew up, what it was like growing up with that family around them in that hometown, in that time and place. You got to find out what their great challenges in life have been as they've moved along. You gotta learn who it was that broke their heart. You gotta find out what their greatest hopes and dreams are in life. You have to learn their story. And until you learn their story, you don't really know them. Well, with that in mind, I'm gonna go back to Moses. And I wanna share with you how it is that Moses says that mothers and fathers need to be teaching their children. You go down a little bit further in Deuteronomy 6, and this is what Moses teaches. He says, in the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations and the decrees and the laws that the Lord your God has commanded you? You see, that's what I mean when I say Moses realized what the problem was going to be, right? That little junior is going to come up to the breakfast table one day, is going to look around and say, why do we do all this weird stuff? Why can't I have bacon 
with my breakfast, right? Why? That's a great question, isn't it? Why are the cleanliness laws what they are, right? Why are the laws around worship and what we can and can't do socially, why do all of those things exist? That doesn't happen with other peoples. Well, how could Moses have answered this? Moses could have said, well, God is sovereign. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God is omnipotent. And we serve God, and we're in submission to God, and therefore we do what God says, right? It's all a bunch of rules, okay? He could have listed it out like a doctrinal statement. That's not actually what Moses does. If you read what he does, it goes like this. Then you shall tell him, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. But the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord set signs, sent signs and wonders, great and terrible on Egypt and Pharaoh and on his whole household. But he brought us out from there in order to bring us in and to give us the land that he promised on oath to our ancestors. Just look what Moses is doing. He's telling the Hebrews that they have to teach their children the story of how they got to be where they are with the Lord. In other words, if they want to know who they are, they've got to learn the story of who God is and who God is for them. There is no doctrinal statement. There is no bullet-pointed list of God's attributes. Instead, there is a reminder. You were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. He had you bent under the weight of heavy stones with the sun beating hot upon your face. You were in anguish. You were in pain. You cried out to God in your weakness and in your suffering. And because of God, because God is who he is, he heard and he remembered that you were his children. And he didn't leave you under that hard yoke of slavery, but he raised you up with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. And he carried you through those long years in the wilderness so that he could bring you into a land that he had promised on oath to your forefathers. He is a God who keeps his promises. He told the story, in other words. Now, we could say that God is all-powerful and God is all-knowing. We could say that God is sovereign over the creation. And all those things are true. But in order to know who God really is, we've got to know God's story. You know, throughout the year, I preach on a lot of different topics and we preach from a lot of different parts of the Bible. You never know what that's going to be from series to series, do you? Well, that's true for 11 months of the year. But there is one month of the year that you know exactly what we're going to be focusing on, don't you? Because that Sunday after Thanksgiving, we enter into a new season, which is called the season of Advent. That means the season of God's arrival or of God's coming. And during that season of the year, we always read the same story and we always preach on the same topic. And why is that? Because it is the most precious story that we have. And it is the topic that is more important than any other. It is the story of how God looked down upon us and saw that we too were in slavery to sin. God saw that we were laboring under suffering. God heard our anguished cries and God remembered that we too are his children and he came to us in the person of Jesus that we might be liberated and set free in the way opened for us to eternal life. If you want to know that where the beginning of practicing a family faith with our children and in our homes lies, it lies with recognizing who God is through the story that God has with us. This past week, I left on Sunday afternoon with another pastor friend from Rogers. We went down to Little Rock so that we could get this. This is the kind of 
invites that I get, okay? The Arkansas Retired Minister's Luncheon <laughs> on Monday. Don't you wish you had gone with me? Now, usually it's at a church down in central Arkansas. Last week it was at the governor's mansion, which I'd never been to before. And so that was pretty neat, actually, to kind of hang out for a couple of hours in the governor's mansion with a bunch of retired preachers from around the state of Arkansas. But I, I went because the speaker on Monday was a dear friend of mine, David Watson, who teaches New Testament at United Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. And as a part of the message that David brought to us, he told a story of something that actually happened to him and his family this past spring. He said it was back in March in Ohio, it's still pretty nippy in March, and he was sitting out on his back porch with his laptop <clears throat> in his lap doing some work late one afternoon when all of a sudden he smelled smoke. He said he didn't think much about it, the weather being what it is in Ohio in March. He just assumed that somebody had stoked up the fire pit on their own back porch in the neighborhood, and they were getting ready for some type of an evening gathering. And so he said he went on about his work. But a few minutes later, <clears throat> he realized that the smoke smell was not getting less, it was getting more. And all of a sudden, in a moment of shock and horror, he realized that the smoke was coming out of his own house. And so he said he leapt up and he ran inside and there was his daughter standing there with a look of horror on her face. And he scooped her up and he got her outside and he went back in knowing that his son, Sean, who has Down syndrome, was upstairs. And so he rounded the corner and started up the stairs and realized with even greater horror that the smoke was all billowing out of the second floor. And he got to the top of the stairs and he could hear his son Sean's voice in the bathroom, the hallway bathroom, and he tried to make his way down the hall. He said it was still light outside, but that the hallway was as black as pitch. And he took two steps down the hall and the smoke filled his ears and his nose and his eyes, and he immediately became panicked that he was going to pass out from smoke inhalation and that he'd never wake up. And so he did the hardest thing that he ever had to do in his life. In order to save his son, he had to turn his back on where he knew his son was and go back down the stairs and go outside he said as he ran around the side of the house, just on instinct, he passed the grill and he grabbed the lid of the grill, of the round grill, off and he ran around the side of the house where the window to the hallway bathroom was and he said he began hurling the lid up against the house. After the third or fourth throw, he said finally he hit the window perfectly and it crashed through the window and immediately, he said, Sean's head came out of the window. He was gasping for air. And David said he reached his hands up to Sean and just began talking to him, trying to calm him down. And by that point, he could hear the sirens coming down the street. And he stayed just like that, as close to his son as he could, until the fireman brought the ladder and scrambled up and grabbed Sean out of the bathroom, brought him down, and then David just cradled his son in his arms. Now, this is a man who teaches the Bible for a living. He, he's a professor of New Testament. But he said that day, he realized something about God on a soul level, on a heart level, at a depth that he had never known before. And that is about what the fatherhood of God really means. He said in those panicked few minutes, he wanted nothing more in his life than to get to his son. He had to get to his son to save him. And he said he realized afterwards that when God looks down on us, he looks down on us with that same father's heart. This panicked sense that he has to get to us, that he has to save us, that he has to rescue us from the flames, that he has to get us out of the burning house. He hears our cries, and he's relentless in coming after us until he can finally reach us. There are a lot of things that God has called in the Bible. 
He's called a king, a sovereign. He's called a lawgiver and a judge. He's called a shepherd and a redeemer. But you know what those things are? They're all jobs. They're all titles. They're roles that God fills. Before God is any of those things, he is our father. The one thing that God has called in the Bible that is not a title, that is not a job, is father. It goes deeper than that. It is God's very identity. Now, I believe that that is the starting point for practicing a family faith. Because when you realize how God feels towards you, then all of a sudden you can realize how important it is to shape and form your children in the faith so that they can come to know God in that way. And how we think about God shapes and and affects how we think about ourselves in relation to our own children. It, It It changes everything about how we believe that we are to instruct our children and and, and care for our children and teach our children. I told you last week that I'm reading this book by Winfield Bevins called Faith at Home that's talking about how you practice the family faith. And I came across a passage in that book this past week that I think says it so well. It says, what we believe about God, about his love, about his discipline, and about his forgiveness will affect how we love and how we forgive and how we discipline our children. You realize all of a sudden that you don't have to do it perfectly. You just have to do it as a father or as a mother. If you realize that God is your parent and loves you as a parent, then you as a parent or as a grandparent or as an aunt or as an uncle, you can love your own little ones in that same way. God is relational with us. He wants us to know him the way that we want our children to know ourselves. Think about that. That God wants us to know him the way that we want our own children to to know us. And so there are only a few things that we need to do every day. And we can do them without fear and without intimidation. And that is simply gathering our children together, praying for them and with them, reading a Bible story with them every day, sharing our own faith, even and maybe especially if your faith has never been as strong as you would like for it to be. Share it anyway. Understand that as a mother and as a father, you can love them in the same way that God as a father loves you. And that actually, you can be the vehicle through which they come to know God for themselves. You know, when we go out in the backyard and we throw a ball around with our kids... You never worry about whether or not your kids are going to think you're an NFL quarterback or not, do you? You never worry about whether or not you, they're going to think you were a Major League Baseball pitcher. And if that's the case, then, then, then why is it that we worry about reading the Bible with our kids or, or talking about our faith with our kids or, or telling our kids about Jesus? I mean, throughout my entire ministry, I've had people tell me that they're scared that their kids are going to ask them a question they don't know the answer to. They're scared they're going to ask their kids a question about something that perhaps they haven't experienced for themselves. And so as a result, they shy away from even reading the Bible with their kids or praying with their kids or, or talking to their kids about the Lord. But what if it's not about being perfect? What if it's about just being willing? Because here's the thing, and this is true. Your children are not going to, they're not going to remember whether or not you had all the answers. They're just going to remember that you were there. That you were willing to read out of God's word to them. That you were willing to pray with them. That you were willing to teach them about Jesus. The great theologian Jonathan Edwards, who Uh, lived in the same time period as John Wesley, once wrote, every family ought to be, as it were, 
a little church. Isn't that wonderful? And it's true. If your children are ever going to come to know the story of Jesus, odds are they're going to come to know it because you shared it with them. And if they're ever going to think that it's important, they're going to think it's important because they see you thinking that it's important. By sharing that story with them, you're sharing with them the Lord himself. And that is something that will last forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.